The Wisconsin Music Hall Hour presents a special transcribed broadcast of Wisconsin's 92nd Founders Day program. Tonight, the great State University of Wisconsin is celebrating its 92nd birthday anniversary with this program broadcast from the Wisconsin Union's new theater on the university campus in Madison. Since the university's first class met on February 5th, 1849, Wisconsin's far-flung alumni family has grown to more than 70,000 men and women scattered throughout the world. Many Wisconsin alumni clubs in all parts of the nation are meeting tonight to honor their university and to listen to this program dedicated to it. During this broadcast, sponsored by the Wisconsin Alumni Association, we will hear brief messages on this general theme, the responsibility of university-trained men and women in the present world crisis. From Clarence A. Dykstra, 11th president of the university, Michael J. Cleary, president of Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, and Philip D. Reed, chairman of the board of the General Electric Company, with specially arranged music by the university's world-famous Pro Arte String Quartet and the University of Wisconsin Band, directed by Professor Raymond Dvorak, now playing the Wisconsin Pride March. <laughs> take pleasure in presenting now Clarence A. Dykstra, president of the University of Wisconsin and director of the nation's first peacetime selective service law. Mr. Dykstra. <laughs> Greetings to you all wherever you may be tonight. Only one year has slipped away since Founders Day of 1940. But we live in an unbelievably different world. A year ago, there was talk of a phony war. Except for the fact that Americans hung over their radios to keep up with the European news, we were, as a people, quite sure of our insulation from the actual impact of war. We were concerned largely with our domestic concerns, high taxes, our mounting debt, and speculation about presidential nominations. But as spring came on, there was talk of appropriations for defense. And on June 20th, the introduction in Congress of what came to be known as the Selective Service Act. Little did we in the field of education realize that by the time the school year opened in the fall, we would be discussing with our students their place in national defense, and that we would be training a reserve army of a million men during the next nine months. This Founders Day, our 92nd, finds our university along with others committed to the service of the nation in accelerated fashion. We have always served the nation in preparing Wisconsin youth to take on the responsibilities throughout the country. Our laboratories and our scientists have made great contributions to the welfare and prosperity of the American people. But the tempo of this effort is being speeded up, at least psychologically, and we find ourselves asking what, in addition, universities can do in the interest of our country and of national defense. I suggest without opportunity for arguing the case that we have continuing and permanent responsibilities along with other educational institutions for doing definite things over and above the immediate defense needs of the nation. First, we must safeguard and defend the inescapable implications of the democratic way. We must realize that our choice is not 
between liberty and safety, that the time does not come when freedom becomes an outworn shibboleth to be cast aside as a luxury with which we can dispense, that liberty is rather a weapon to be used than just a theory to be defended, that we defend freedom by using it, and that it is as important to have democracy fight for the country as to have the country fight for democracy. Second, these are times when emotional discipline in the colleges is just as important as mental training. It is easy to set up straw men to be attacked and bogeymen to be suspected when we live at high tension. We succumb to fear in the face of isms, so-called, instead of practicing the dynamics of democracy or invoking the strength of the Constitution. What we need to remember is that we cannot abrogate moral responsibility or anesthetize freedom of conscience if we wish to be strong in purpose and faithful to our commitments as free men. We may well be in agreement on ends, but at the same time differ widely on the means to be used. Let us cherish the opportunity to differ and to express these differences. Three. Education is not served by junking its implications and imperatives. If we trust the educational purpose at all, we must protect its processes. This is true national defense. Internal discipline and fortitude also need cultivation and exercise in times like these. We at Wisconsin renew our faith tonight in the vision and purpose of the generation which founded this university. We believe in the future of our great country and in our developing democracy. We let us not lose the great hope and let us not fail to work for it even while we prepare stupendously against any aggressor who threatens the promise of America to her children. With the university band singing the song, If You Want to Be a Badger, this program celebrating the University of Wisconsin's 92nd Founders Day is now switched to the Milwaukee, Wisconsin Alumni Dinner, where it will be continued. We take you now to Milwaukee. Continuing here at the Milwaukee, Wisconsin Alumni Club Dinner, we present Michael J. Cleary, president of the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company and member of the University Board of Regents, who graduated from Wisconsin in 1901. Mr. Michael J. Cleary. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> uh, this is a grand privilege to have the opportunity to speak for Wisconsin alumni, a goodly number of whom <coughs> are assembled here tonight. In their name, I send greetings to our fellow alumni wherever they are. I'm asked to speak about our obligation and opportunity for service in these troubled times. The obligation of service and of leadership rests heavily upon the shoulders of the direct beneficiaries of the training received in a tax-supported institution. But where do these obligations attach? in times like the present. To me, it's clear that a first 
and all important responsibility is the preservation for future generations of the benefits and blessings that we of this generation have had and still enjoy. We must recognize the fact that these privileges came to us only through the sacrifices of others. We must recognize the fact that we are trustees for the generations yet to come. It is not a platitude to say that a major necessity of these chaotic times is sane thinking. It's neither cynical nor harsh to say that there's great confusion in our thinking today. I fear that we're too much motivated in our attitude and our actions by our emotions and too little by our reason. The work of America is not done. The frontiers of opportunity in America are not exhausted. The concept expressed in the political, economic, and social plan and structure of America is not outmoded. What we have here is not perfect. It's the product of human minds, and it was not given to us humans to be perfect in conception or execution. However, I confidently assert that this structure, with all of its faults, has brought more hope, happiness, and opportunity to humans than any other similar structure in the history of man. So I say the first and most important responsibility of leadership today is to preserve and improve the American plan and way of life. That responsibility rests upon all leadership. Another crying need is national unity. The solution of America's problems is the joint responsibility of every American. It's your job and mine. No miracle man and no Moses is coming to do that job for us. The preservation of America <coughs> and the solution of its problems <coughs> means sacrifice, not sacrifice by a group or class, Sacrifice was necessary to create America, and sacrifice is necessary to perpetuate it. Leadership not only must make us conscious of the necessity of unity, but also of sacrifice. I do not ignore the pressing necessity of today's program of preparedness. All agree that that tremendous and immediate necessity must be met now but serious, important, deep and diversified problems are to confront it when that problem finished and the wars are ended. We must prepare for that time. Wisconsin is proud of the men and women that it trained and sent into the nation. Wisconsin will go on training men and women for leadership in performing the stern task and making the grave decisions that lie ahead of us. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cleary. Our program returns now to the university campus at Madison, Wisconsin. Back on the campus of the University of Wisconsin, we continue this 92nd Wisconsin Founders Day program with a selection by the world-famous Pro Arte String Quartet, formerly of Brussels, Belgium, but now the University of Wisconsin. This fine quartet, which has given concerts in all of the large European cities as well as throughout the United States, will play a Pulitzer Music Prize selection 
Andante Sostenuto from String Quartet in C minor, composed by Professor Carl Bricken, director of the University of Wisconsin School of Music. take you now to New York, where another widely known Wisconsin alumnus, Philip D. Reed, chairman of the board of General Electric Company, will speak to you. Mr. Reed. Okay. The history and tradition of a nation, a family or a school, serve at once the functions of the keel of a great vessel 
and the proud pennant at her masthead. The one provides stability to hold the course amidst adverse currents and conditions, while the other holds high the lofty ideals and purposes adopted and proclaimed by their founders. Because earlier generations have manned the vessel, be she a ship of state, of lineage, or of learning, and because they have followed the same star, the venture is somehow enriched and ennobled for those who carry on. There is nothing rigid or dogmatic in this concept, nor do the inspirational values that derive from association with antiquity prevent or discourage a willing, nay, eager consideration of new methods, new techniques, new programs designed to improve our modern way of viewing things and doing things. Indeed, a distinguished history and tradition, if thoroughly understood and liberally interpreted, should stimulate thoughtful and discriminating analysis of the problems of today and the formulation of plans for the betterment of American society tomorrow. But note, please, the qualifications, the conditions mentioned in that sentence. Our history and traditions must be thoroughly understood and liberally interpreted if they are to serve their rightful and invaluable purpose as a protector and preserver of fundamental principles and as a treasure chest of practical experience for our use and guidance. In an old textbook on the law, these words appear. The law will yield up its reason to no man who lacks the patience to study its history. The same, the very same, is true of American life in all its phases. Our form of democracy, its creation and evolution. The deliberate separation of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government. The concept of government of, by, and for the people as distinguished from the totalitarian philosophy. Our system of, pr of free private enterprise as distinguished from government regimentation and control of factories, farms, and workers. Our traditional and constitutional liberties, both civil and religious, and all the other protections of the Bill of Rights. These things must be understood to be appreciated, to be preserved and improved. It is perhaps not unnatural that most of us here in America do not fully realize what our system of government means to us because we have never lived in a country ruled by a dictator. War is being waged all about us to determine whether dictatorship shall dominate the world. We in America are rapidly preparing to defend our independence and our way of life. With our magnificent production facilities and organization, Industry will arm this nation amply and in time. Our way of life and our form of government can and will be preserved if the American people wish them to be preserved. But unless we all know what that form of government is, unless we recognize and oppose measures and trends tending to destroy it either from without or from within, we shall sooner or later lose it by default. The obvious remedy is education. America, both young and old, must know its own history and background. It must be told truthfully and without bias the difference between our system of government and the totalitarian form. It must be given a better understanding of everyday economics, the nature of money, the importance of production, the causes of inflation, the relationship between wages, prices, and the cost of living the nature and function of profit, the control of governmental receipts and expenditures. Equally important is the need that, not simply now, but always, the story of our country and our way of life be told and taught by men and women who know and love American life. For American citizenship is a matter of the heart as well as of the mind. It is more than facts and logic and self-interest. It is gratitude and sportsmanship and pride. It is faith and fearlessness and charity. It is, in the deepest and richest sense, loyalty. Leader that she is and has been through her 92 years of distinguished service, I know that my beloved alma mater will carry on in the great work of spreading the gospel of America to all Americans. Thus, and only thus will our national defense program be well-rounded and effective on all fronts.
Thank you, Mr. Reed. Our program returns now to Madison, Wisconsin. Back on the campus of the University of Wisconsin, we continue our program celebrating the university's 92nd birthday with the university band playing the heroic march by Schubert, arranged for band by Louis Blaha. <laughs> As we greeted you, so welcome to our program. We leave you with the Wisconsin Pride March. <laughs> Listening to the 92nd Founders Day program of the University of Wisconsin, which was celebrated on the university campus in Madison recently. This has been a special transcribed broadcast of the Wisconsin Music Hall Hour, heard over this station each week at this same time. <laughs>